Let us pray. Father, we still our hearts before you this morning and we give you thanks for your word. We thank you for this Trinity Sunday when we give thanks to the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And Lord, as we try to understand the working of the Trinity and the work of each person in the Trinity, we pray, Lord, that you would just guide us, give us clarity in our thinking, that, Lord, whatever we hear from your word, we would not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. And so, Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Today is Trinity Sunday, the Sunday after Pentecost, a day the Christian church historically has celebrated as one of its central beliefs, that of a triune God, God the Holy Trinity. At the beginning of the fourth century in Alexandria in the north of Egypt, a theologian named Arius began teaching that Jesus was a created being and not truly God. He did so because he believed that God is the origin and cause of everything, but is not caused to exist by anything else. And so he used to call God as uncaused or unoriginate. And he therefore held was the best basic definition of who God is. But since the son, being a son, must have received his being from the father, he could not, by Arius's definition, be God. And Arius persuaded many, but Athanasius, one of his colleagues, dedicated the rest of his life to proving how catastrophic the Arian thinking was for actual Christian living. So we cannot understand the Father without looking at Jesus. It is the Son who reveals Jesus, who reveals the Father to us. And when we do that, starting with the Son, we find that the first thing to say about God, as it says in the Creed, we believe in God the Father. And Trinity Sunday is a Sunday to thank God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who together form the Godhead. The word Trinity is not mentioned in the Bible. The Trinity as such is not easy to comprehend. Is it one God in three persons, or three in one? How do we understand this doctrine? Augustine, one of the greatest theologians of the Christian faith said, anyone who denies the Trinity is in danger of losing their salvation. And anyone who tries to understand it is in danger of losing their mind. And it took the early church nearly 300 years to complete the wording of Trinitarian orthodoxy producing the Nicene Creed, which we say every morning. And so this morning, I want us to look at the three passages that were read to us. And we will be looking at the work of the Father, the work of the Son, and the work of the Holy Spirit. And if we look at all three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we will notice that their work is the same. There is the work of revelation, there is a work of redemption, there is the work of relationship, and there is the work of empowering us. Let's look at the first passage from 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 to 30. And this is a prayer of Solomon when he stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel and spread out his hands towards heaven. 
and this is at the dedication of the temple. And he says, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant love with your servants, who continue wholeheartedly in your way. You have kept your promise to your servant David, my father, with your mouth you have promised and with your hand you have fulfilled it as it is today. Solomon begins with a confession that God is unique. He is unchanging in his faithfulness. God keeps his covenant of love to all those who continue wholeheartedly in his ways. And this affirmation mirrors Deuteronomy 7, 7 to 9, which focuses on the Lord's loving, gracious choice of Israel. Deuteronomy 7, 9 reads, Know therefore the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations, to those who love him and keep his commands. And therefore there is no obligation nor legalism, nor a desire to control others for personal gain. That doesn't motivate God. Every miracle, every saving act flows from divine mercy and grace. Now Solomon's confidence in God's willingness to condescend to human level actually emerges from four principles. First of all, he knows that God has revealed himself in the past. And we know that in the story of Moses, that God reveals himself. In the burning bush, he says, I am who I am. God chose Moses and Aaron and then led the people out. So there was a revelation. There was a redemption. And then there was a relationship where God makes a covenant with them on Mount Sinai where he says, you will be my people and I will be your God. And he shows them his power. So God has revealed himself in the past. God reveals, God redeems. And we know that from the Exodus. Secondly, we see that God seeks a covenant relationship with Israel as a nation and with each individual Israelite. So not only there is revelation, not only there is redemption, there is a relationship. Solomon can expect God to fulfill the promise made in Deuteronomy 12, 4 to 11, to put his name in the central worship site because he knows God's character. God is faithful, God is loving, God is consistent, God is relational and that he will continue to meet human beings where they live. Even though God is lofty and holy and mysterious, yet he is approachable and personal at the same time. So the temple will serve as the physical symbol of these divine realities. Here the unapproachable Lord becomes approachable and ready to help those who worship, sacrifice and pray. And so we see in this Old Testament passage that the Father is involved in the work of revelation. The Father is involved in the work of redemption. The Father is involved in the work of relationship. And the Father reveals his power in order to save his people. And that is exactly what he prays, Solomon prays, and asks God, and he says, may your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, this place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will ever hear the prayer your servant prays towards this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. Let's move on to the second part, which is the work of Jesus. And that we see in the gospel reading from John's gospel, chapter 14, verses 18 to 17, 8 to 17. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? 
anyone who has seen me has seen the father how can you say show us the father don't you believe that i am in the father and the father is in me the words that i say to you i do not speak on my own authority rather it is the father living in me who is doing his work believe me when i say that i am in the father and the father is in me or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves very truly i tell you who believes in me will do the works i've been doing and they will do even greater things than these because i am going to the father and i will do whatever you ask in my name so that the father may be glorified in the son you may ask for anything in my name and i will do it and so yes here we see again jesus doing the same actions jesus reveals the father to us jesus redeems us by a sacrificial death jesus engages in us wanting us to have a relationship with him and jesus gives us power so we see here the address is to the post resurrection community of faith whoever believes in me will do the works i have been doing and even greater things because i am going to the father and the works is the reference to the miracles that jesus has done the work of the son was to reveal the father to us it was only when we look at the life and work of jesus christ that we understand who god is god is who jesus was for us it is only through the life and work of jesus that we understand the character of god jesus therefore challenges the disciples to ask for whatever they need in jesus' name so that the father would be clarified the point is that when we ask in line with the character of jesus it will be done for us name stands for character so if you ask for god, if you ask god for someone's salvation or for some healing or from for some deliverance then we are asking according to his name but if we ask for something selfish then we are not asking according to his name jesus also assures us of power he says you will do greater things he says very truly i tell you who believes in me will do the works i have been doing they will even do greater things than these because i am going to the father so jesus will do miraculous works in and through us so that the father's name will be glorified and jesus will act as a mediator for us and then in the midst of this jesus again talks about relationship he says in verse 15 if you love me keep my commandments and i will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be with you so jesus now shows that the true indicator of love is obedience to his commands all our claims to follow jesus has to be shown in walking the talk this is critical if you are to be tr- a trusted disciples of christ that the spirit paraclete is introduced as another paraclete as another advocate is because jesus himself is also our advocate because in 1 john 2 1 it says if anyone sins we have a paraclete with the father jesus christ the righteous one So the ascended lord is also a paraclete or a advocate in the court of heaven pleading for us and then Jesus promises us the holy spirit as a paraclete from heaven supporting and representing the disciples in the face of a hostile world the world cannot see the activity of the spirit because it has rejected the revelation of Jesus and the consequent blindness which is the judgment of god and so we see here again the work of the son is to reveal the father the work of the son is to bring about redemption the work of the son is that we have a relationship with him 
the work of the son is that we will have his power and let's move on to the holy spirit from romans 8 verses 1 to 11 and paul writing to the roman says therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus because through christ jesus the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death for what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh god did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering and so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh but according to the spirit now here again we see that the essential contrast that paul paints is between the weakness of the law and the power of the spirit for over against indwelling sin which is the reason the law is unable to help us in our moral struggle paul now sets the indwelling spirit who is both our liberator from now from the law of sin and death and the guarantee of resurrection and eternal glory in the end so the christian life is essentially life in the spirit that is to say a life which is animated sustained and directed and enriched by the holy spirit without the holy spirit true christian discipleship would not would be inconceivable indeed impossible and then paul talks in verses 9 to 11 you however are not in the realm of the flesh but are in the realm of the spirit if indeed the spirit of god lives in you and if anyone does not have the spirit of christ they do not belong to christ but if christ is in you then even though your body is subject to death because of sin the spirit gives life because of righteousness and if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead is living in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of a spirit who lives in you so paul clearly says that you are not in the flesh you are in the spirit since the spirit of god dwells in you and anyone who does not have the spirit of christ does not belong to him but if christ is in you then the body is dead because of sin the spirit is life because of righteousness the spirit who raised jesus from the dead he will raise us up also in ephesians 1 19 and 20 paul says that this immeasurable power is available for us to believe according to the working of his great power god put his power to work in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand and in the heavenly places and therefore this power is available to us the same power that raised jesus from the dead and so therefore we need to ask ourselves the questions why on earth are we as christians so powerless we need to use the power of the spirit that is available to us the spirit reveals and continues to teach all that jesus has taught us the spirit helps us in our redemption he seals us when we receive christ the spirit helps us in this relationship with jesus and the spirit empowers us and therefore finally in verses 12 and 13 paul says therefore brothers and sisters we have an obligation but it's not to the sinful nature to live according to it for you live for if you live according to the sinful nature you will die but if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body you will live and therefore now paul concludes with the work of the spirit that we have an obligation why because christ has died for us christ is risen christ will come back again and christ has given us the spirit the obligation is not to live according to our sinful nature wasting our time chasing the desires of our flesh he says the outcome of following our sinful nature will be death it will result definitely in eternal death and sometimes in physical death as well but paul says put to death 
He says, for if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. By the spirit we are called to put to death the misdeeds of our body. How do we put to death our sinful desires? Is it good enough to put, to put them to death once? Imagine our sinful nature waking up like a dead man who is being taken on a beer. It is an ongoing process and the battle is often in the mind. If we can take hold of our minds and bring every thought captive to Christ, then we would have won the battle. 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And so, friends, we see the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the same. In terms, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit reveal themselves to us. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are involved in our redemption. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are the ones who strengthen us. They reveal, they redeem us, they want a relationship with us, and they empower us. It was the Father's love that made him send his only Son to live among us and die for us so that we may live. It was the Son's love for us that made him take, away the, way, take the way of the cross so that we may live. It was the love of the Holy Spirit who resides within us and renews and transforms us that we may indeed have life and have it abundantly. And so as we look back on this Trinity Sunday, we are grateful to God for his great love for us that he sent his son to die for us. We are grateful to God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are called to live lives of gratitude filled with the power of Jesus and carry out his work which he began. We are called to keep our minds set on what the Holy Spirit desires and to put to death the deeds of our body. Maybe this Trinity Sunday feel encouraged that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all at work in the transformation of our lives so that we will become more and more like Christ. May God bless each one of you. Let us pray. Father, we still our hearts before you on this Trinity Sunday. We thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Thank you that you reveal yourself to us. Thank you that you redeem us. Thank you that you seek a relationship with us. And thank you that you make your power available to us. And so, Father, we pray that you would continue to draw us all closer to you, that we may walk after you faithfully. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.